Christians live always in Advent, in the expectation of the future of Christ. We talk about Advent. Advent is that season where we're talking about uh, the God that is coming. The Advent story is getting ready for a bodily intrusion of the transformative power of God into the historical process. Jesus is a Jesus is a tricky figure in some ways, particularly as we move into uh, Advent and start the birthday celebration. Mostly, I think, because we make him too sterile. Uh, you know, if you if you use the lectionary, the, the first two or three Sundays of Advent, you're not getting shepherds and angels and the baby Jesus, right? You're getting like these crazy apocalyptic texts, including the one that, that says that like two will be in the field and one will be taken and one will stay and that, you know, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And um, there's something about seeing Jesus as a holy thief, you know, in our first Advent together, I started thinking about, you know, maybe the idea of God breaking in and jacking our stuff uh, doesn't need to be heard as like bad news. Like maybe instead of making a Christmas list, which is stuff that like we want Santa to bring us to our house, we make Advent lists in the church, which are stuff that we would really love for Jesus to abscond with in the middle of the night. Like if Jesus could come and like take, I don't know, like but my body image issues or my, uh, my uh, love of, uh, of self or my um, obsession with, uh, with being, trying to be worthy, right? There's so much stuff that's weighing us down that we actually need a holy thief to come and steal from us. And I try to meditate on that in Advent. Like, get, help me get rid of this stuff, man. Just help me get rid of it. So come as a thief in the night, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. That's Advent, you know. You know, the word Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, meaning um, arrival, right? Coming, the coming. And I think, you know, it's that preparation for the coming of Christ. Um, but the fact is, um, in a sense, what do we mean by that, right? And I do think I th uh, there's two things. One, in a, son in a sense, I think I asked the question, I'm giving a retreat in a few weeks, and the question, if, um, if uh, God has already come to us, what are we waiting for? You know, in the sense, if God has already become incarnate in Jesus, what are we waiting for? And I think um, that's a, a really interesting question, you know. Uh, I don't think we really have a good sense of what Advent's about. My mother tells me that even when I was really small, I said, oh, it's Advent. Well, maybe that was partly because it meant Christmas is coming, but that's not all. It just made me realize, even as a child, that the church is not afraid to look into the dark and to say, this is a dark world with dark things happening in it. And in the midst of this dark world, God happens in spite of ourselves. Advent is the recovery of how to live in a world of impatience as a patient people. So here's the thing about what that Advent reminds us of, that God is always coming toward us. God never turns God's back on us. God's always coming toward us. It's really nice, I think, about the Advent liturgy is that the readings that are normally set up in the lectionary cycles start with, as it were, something coming which sounds as though it's going to be violent gets less and less violent and then it ends in something absolutely unremarkable <laughs> and that's the remarkable thing about it it's the undoing of the expectation of the remarkable is the unremarkable yes exactly I think and what my, one of my ways of putting it is that um, since I, I'm a pacifist so uh, I say um, um, that Christians are called to nonviolence, not because we believe nonviolence is a strategy to rid the world of war, 
but in a world of war, as faithful followers of Christ, we cannot imagine being anything other than nonviolent. And that will make the world possibly more violent because the world does not want the order it calls peace exposed as the violence it so oftentimes is. Now, learning how to wait as a people of nonviolence in a world of war, you'll know what Advent is. <laughs> the Advent liturgy is it's the undoing of wrath. The assumption that if God is going to arrive, then it will look wrathful. <laughs> um, and the realization, you know, this was, even John the Baptist expected that. John the Baptist was pretty thrown by Jesus not being as wrathful as he had expected. And the realization that actually there is no wrath at all in God, that wrath is our wrath, and we're pretty good at it. <laughs> and that God is going to start undoing all of that from within, starting from the most vulnerable place that a human can be, which is as a baby. He is coming soon as a baby. So. <laughs> so the shepherds thought, the shepherds are a metaphor for the forgotten people. The shepherds were filled with wonder. And the angels said, uh, you ought to be filled with wonder. This is important. History is being broken open with new possibility. What's possible? That the blind will see, the lame will walk, the lepers will be cleansed, the dead will be raised, and the poor will be happy. It is not possible under our current system, but it is possible. You think we're lacking wonder? <laughs> yes, we are lacking wonder. What gives you hope? the script and the community that practices it. Advent is, reminds us that God is always, always coming uh, toward us. And not esoterically, but in movements toward justice, toward freedom, which always are these perfect reflections of God's love. Our task is to go toward God. That's the Advent season to me. That's what it reminds us of, that we have people that must be going toward the God that is coming toward us. And we do that through acts of justice. Advent is patience. It's, God. it's taking, it's how God has made us a people of promise in a world of impatience. And, um, uh, and and Christ has made that possible for us to live patiently in a world of impatience. So for me, the hope in the Advent season period is, is not about a hope to come, but a hope that has come. And it's not about us waiting on a Jesus who will at some point reach us, but for us to reach out to those Jesus died for that are within reach. I think that that Advent, that waiting, that arrival, or what's coming to us from the future, I think we can say that's God coming to us from the future in a sense that, you know, we're called to awaken to what's already in our midst. Uh, so it's that um, I think Advent is a coming to a new consciousness of God, you know, um, already loving us into something new, into something more whole. Uh, that we're not, in a sense, waiting for what's not there. We're, in a sense, to be attending to what's already there. I, I have to hope in knowing that the King is already here. I can't, uh, I can't wait for something to, you know, something to happen. You know, it's, uh, that's not enough to keep me in this, in this thing. 
uh, I've got to know that, uh, that the king has already made it and that we, uh, we're on the same page. Uh, we can think of Advent as God is waiting for us <laughs> to wake up, you know, as if we're asleep in the manger, not Jesus. Uh, Jesus is, you know, alive in our midst. And sometimes I do think we have things a little bit backwards. You know, I think uh, Jesus is in the manger and we've got to wake him up and now, you know, we have to do uh, good things to one another. But what if we're in the manger and God is all already awakened in our midst? And we're so fallen asleep, we're so kind of unconsciously asleep that God is sort of looking for, you know, uh, will someone, you know, get up uh, and help, you know, bring this, uh, the gifts, you know, I I into the world. You know, that, that's, that, that whole Advent thing, matter of fact, I have, I have wrestled with it um, ever since becoming a, a Christian. Matter of fact, I was dialoguing with some young young friends of mine recently, uh, all of, all of whom became uh, uh, followers of Jesus uh, as a result of our encounters, and uh, and they were reminding me that uh, that they were uh, they were followers of Jesus because of the resurrection. You know, and they really, they told me very very candidly, say like Rudy, if if he ain't alive, I'm out, and and I had to understand that because I really believe the same thing. If he ain't alive, I'm out. It's a story about God <clears throat> taking the risk of showing up in the flesh. One stable, one manger, one Mary, one Joseph, one night. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's a very hard story to retrieve in the midst of a culture that obviously commercializes it almost to death. And sometimes in the midst of a church that is more drawn to triumphalism than it is to the simplicity of what I think of as the real thing. Come on, I, I'm supposed to believe that? I think that's a risk that we're all called to, the risk of incarnation, the risk of embodying uh, our values and our beliefs, the risk of manifesting our identity and integrity in the world, the risk of being fully human. That's the scandal of the particular. That's the scandal of the incarnation. Incarnation is always concrete, particular, momentary, now here, now this, and when you, when you struggle with the now this and go deep enough in one place, you know what happens is it universalizes. That's what poets understand and why poetry is so good. A good poet tries to lead you into universal experience by leading you into the shocked, concrete experience of one flower, one frog, one dog, one tree, uh, one rooster, yeah, one rooster. Uh, that's what it takes to, to pull you into the depth of anything. And when you get to the depth of anything, for some wonderful reason, you have the power to get to the deeper stream, the, the universal, the concrete, is the doorway to the universe. <laughs> the exactly. cock keeps crowing. <laughs> this is One more time. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> I don't know the dude. <laughs> uh, to understand big mysteries, you've got to put them on small stages. And that was the wisdom of the church year. Uh, uh, taking 
great mysteries and celebrating them on one day. To focus it, distill it, struggle with it. And that's what we're doing in Advent. We're taking the eternal second coming of Christ. Christ is always coming again. And focusing on it for a few days. And saying, what are my blockages? What is my resistance? What is my stubbornness? What is my closed downness? that's keeping me from uh, welcoming the eternal Christ. That's Advent, and Advent is always. My picture of uh, the Advent season is a circle of three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working out the details of coming to find us in our lostness. And they break the circle and invite a 14-year-old little girl into it and they submit to her. They say, here's what we would like to do. What do you think? And she says, all right, I'm in. And they say, good, then we're going into. that it's retributive and punitive. It's just because, you know, his righteousness was indignated and now he's upset. No, this is not about him. If it's Plato, it's about God because there's only one. But this is about other-centered self-giving love that wants to be shared. And so this is about a God because of love will come to us as a mother who wants to rescue the child. I just don't think God's a punitive God. Punishment and, and C.S. Lewis and George MacDonald, all these guys, they would say, we know punishment changes nothing. It's not about this legal model. It's about a God who pursues us with relentless affection because that is what the nature of love is. And if it, if it has to cross the boundary of this time, it will. We take all the, all the stuff of, of human birth and act like none of that could have possibly been present in, at Jesus' birth. And therefore we then make this sterile savior that none of us can aspire to, yet, we also talk about Jesus being fully human and fully divine. And I think what we do unconsciously often, if not regularly, is we focus on the fully divine part and forget to take into account the fully human part. I'm interested in the fully human part. You know, what is it that made Jesus so, as we say in our old neighborhood, so full of himself, so present in who he was and what he emerges over time, what his mission is to be in life. The, the image I'm trying to conjure is the person who was deeply, deeply aware, to, aware of his humanity. Um, in ways that we tend to walk away from as human beings. We, you know, we dress ourselves up, we make ourselves up, we eat too much or not enough. Um, we do all sorts of things that um, in some ways deny our bodies and the importance of our health. Now, and I think about that a lot as I'm trying harder and harder to be that person that's more embodied and more aware of my health and my mortality and the fact that I've got fewer years in front of me than behind me. So how, how do I make the most of this, this body I've been given that I may not have taken the best care of over the years? 
And not only is that a selfish question for me, but what does that mean as a gift to other people? It's so crazy that God would not spare God's self the indignity of something like hiccups <laughs> or having a pancreas, right? I mean, there's like this fact that God became flesh, like this stuff, the stuff that disappoints us all the time, you know, that sort of gets in the way and um, isn't like we think it should be and ages and um, gets fat and stops producing insulin, right? I mean, the, the ways in which our physical bodies can so um, fumble and disappoint us. And, and yet, this is what God chose to have. That's incredible to me. And I, what does that then mean that we have a human body, that this is, this is the God chose to make God's home within flesh? What does that mean for the fact that I have a human body? And then what does that mean for how much concern I might have for how any human body is treated or trafficked or abused, right? So this, this means something profound to humanity that God chose to walk among us in flesh. That is powerful to me. Jesus mm -hmm. makes complete sense to me. Why? <laughs> because this is my whole thing. I believe God is love. It's that simple and that complicated. And so if you tried to express love to human beings and just came down and said, I am love, love each other. We automatically, because we're so afraid of hard things, we would automatically go to like unicorns and rainbows. And so you would have to send someone to show what love in the flesh looks like. God became human. And so the way, the way the human is addressed is cannot be indifferent for us Christians because we have uh, the Son of God made flesh among us, you know, made one of us, as Paul says in, in the Philippians, you know, made just one of us, one among us, you know, and one without any kind of glory or without any kind of uh, mysterious power, you know, but just one of us with tremendous care for the others. You know? God is seeking to become God in us, which is a way of looking at, you might say, even the incarnation itself. Jesus, in a sense, awakens the human consciousness now to something that's alive in our midst, a new way of being. You would have to send, what does love look like? And so, otherwise, we would romanticize it. We would turn it, we would, we would make it easy because that's who we are as people. We're gonna make it easy. And so then Jesus comes and says, okay, I, I am love. I sit with the people you're not allowed to talk to. I do all the hard things. I make all the hard choices. I love the people that are unlovable. I feed the people who are not supposed to be taken care of. Um, I don't tolerate shame. I don't tolerate attacks. Like I'm love and it's hard and messy and dirty. And if you really love, I mean fierce, big love, you'll become dangerous to people. And so there's no way that most of us could have understood what love was without seeing what love looked like. So to me, it makes perfect sense. And so God is love and Jesus is what love looks like made flesh. And it's hard and it's 
not the default and it has nothing to do with rainbows and unicorns. This stuff don't make sense all the time. And when it don't make sense, man, it's, it's hard to believe in the midst of something that don't make sense. Then I get to the other side of the, the, uh, the challenge of the paradox, and I'm saying, man, I'm glad God is real. I tell people all the time, it's, it's, it's to society's benefit that Jesus exists, because without Jesus, um, I can't honestly say that I'd be a really good guy. You know, I'm a leader either way. Uh, I'm a lead in either direction. Uh, what Jesus did was gave me a, uh, a good reason to lead towards good. And uh, that's why I'm glad he was born. Um, and somebody introduced me to him. Because without him, there's a good possibility I'm leading in the opposite direction. That means everybody would have been in trouble. So I do think, though, we have to um, awaken to the fact that what we already are looking for is already arrived. Uh, it's already here. Uh, and I think we need to, to get out of our unconscious state uh, and get into a new level of awareness and attentiveness. Um, and I also think that Advent points us to a God of the future, right? A God who will always be more than anything we are. So as we awaken to a new being in, in Christ, then we are to become something more in that being in, in Christ. And so Advent is kind of the, kind of the sign that says onward, you know? Uh, the coming to means a moving toward that, okay, you know, great, we've awakened to, now we get up from where we are and move toward. We can't stay where we are, right? Uh, and so uh, that moving toward is what Christmas is about, right? That birthing of Jesus then now is, we are the Christ. Hey, this is the good news, right? Let's awaken to what God is doing in us and what God is seeking to become in us. So I think the gift giving is great. You know, we all love new sweaters and new slippers, but there's something much deeper here that we have to wake up to from our deep slumber, our almost comatose state that we find ourselves in, thanks to the consumer and advertising business, you know, that keeps us nice and lulled <laughs> in, in the dark. Uh, the admonition in the New Testament is not pray, but pray and watch. Pray and watch. Uh, so you must pray with open ears, uh, open ears uh, and open eyes to watch uh, the signs of Christ's coming. And what should we look for? Uh, not of uh, catastrophes. I find I found uh, sometimes in the south of the United States, uh, Christ is coming. Expect earthquakes, diseases, etc. No, uh, I expect miracles. The miracles of the kingdom. Maybe if we're going to move into a new Advent season, maybe we would do well to start with O Sapiencia, Sabiduria in Spanish, the welcoming of a bigger mind. The wisdom mind is a bigger mind than the rational mind. Now, we religious people, we're supposed to be experts at that, but we pretty much settle for information, not transformation. So if Christ is going to come, as Christ forever is, into the world and into our lives, maybe the whole year should be Advent. What would a miracle look like? Uh, the unexpected. Uh, if you don't 
expect the unexpected, you will not find it. Uh, we don't expect the miracles, and therefore we don't see them. They are all around us. I don't know that we can really love others until we've figured out how to truly love ourselves. I think loving ourselves is the hardest thing we do as human beings. And loving ourselves does not mean indulging in everything we possibly can acquire in life. Loving ourselves is having the good sense of knowing that we need to step back and step into a deeper relationship with God with the holy, with the divine. The Christmas story for me is a constant reminder that the calling is really to be born and born and reborn again and again and again in my own, in the shape of my own true self. A baby is very vulnerable. A baby needs nurturing Tending. Uh, that's also true of whatever part of me it is that wants to now come out of hiding, that wants to be embodied and incarnate in the world. And I need that unconditional love to provide that that nurturing and tending. Now, what are those things that sustain us and guide us and hold us? You know, the only way we can, we can live is through love. And, and that's what I'm hanging my hat on. Um, you know, I think, I think once, once we reconcile the fact that love is difficult, but it's the only thing of value uh, in, in life, and at that point, we love, period. And that's the dot typically at the end of a, of a sentence that lets the reader know that there's nothing else you can do beyond that dot except what was stated right before the dot occurred. That's why I'm thinking love, period. Merry Christmas. Hey, same to you.